This is Mr. Burns, and tonight I'm going to go over some slides about what it was like to be a farmer in Minnesota when the first pioneers arrived here. So we've talked about sod, and sod is that thick tangle of roots that lie above the fertile soil. And if you're a farmer and you've got your new farm and it's never been farmed before, it's really going to take you like three years to get all of that land ready to go. So the first season it's going to take a team of oxen to plow the soil. The second season you can do it with one ox. And in the third season it's you can finally do it with a pair of draft horses. Now draft horses are huge animals too. Uh, they weigh anywhere from 1,800 pounds to a ton. And if you take a look at that picture, you can see that these horses are really taller than that man that stands behind them farming. All right, let's take a look at the next slide. Hope. All right, here we go with the second slide. So this talks about my first season. In my first season, I as the homesteader, I'm just going to break enough ground where I can plant things like corn, potatoes, turnips, some vegetables. My goal is to grow enough food to feed my family and to feed my livestock. Now the important word that goes with this is a subsistence farmer. And again, subsistence farming means you're just growing enough to feed your family. You are not making money because really you're eating all the corn, potatoes, and turnips and vegetables that you can grow. The other thing that we should know about uh, this slide is that we want to grow stuff that we can store for a long period of time. So those of you that have gardens at home know that your vegetables like tomatoes, they don't last very long. So the things that are tomatoes, lettuce, green beans, they don't last very long. So the plants that we're growing are like root crops like potatoes and turnips because we can score, store those for a long period of in agriculture cash crops are pretty important a cash crop is something that I can grow that I will make a lot of money off of so like in the south we had cash crops like tobacco and cotton that southern farmers made a lot of money off of in Minnesota that cash crop became wheat it was super important in southern Minnesota it was easy to grow and at first the farmers got good harvest from wheat so uh, homesteaders usually did not grow it again because they were subsistence farmers and they were just trying to get through this season what made wheat farming possible was the railroads and when the railroads rolled in then now we can ship our wheat from far off farms to flour milling cities like Minneapolis I wanted to add one more thing before we go on here. So the railroads made wheat production possible because now we can get our crop to a flour milling center. At a milling center, the wheat is ground up and turned into flour. So at one point in time, they used giant stones to do that. But pretty soon, uh, they're going to start using these uh, gigantic steel rollers to crush the flour grain and to make the wheat. And this was technology that just a few things off of this slide so again wheat was first grown in southeastern Minnesota because that's where uh, the land was first settled wheat production is going to quickly shift to the Red River Valley the soils of the Red River Valley were better for growing wheat uh, wheat was wearing out the soils in southern Minnesota Minneapolis is going to become the nation's flour milling capital and there were a lot of flour mills uh, that line the riverbanks in Minneapolis. Uh, they use the power of St. Anthony Falls to grind all of this wheat. So starting in 1889, Minnesota grew more wheat than any other state. That's what's let, going to let us become the nation's flour milling capital. And that's going to last up until... On this slide, I want to just do a little bit of review there. In the picture, you might notice that that's uh, President Abraham Lincoln. And so this is supposed to be a portrait of him signing the All-Important Homestead Act in 1862 in the middle of the Civil War. The Homestead Act was one of the most important laws passed by our government. And what it did is it helped to settle the whole interior of the country. So a settler could get 160 acres of land under the Homestead Act. And they would move out to the frontier. They would live on the land. They had to farm it for five years build a house and then they could get title to the land after paying a small fee. 
So again, states like Nebraska, Kansas. I want to back up uh, to the second bullet point here. 1862, the Dakota were expelled. So the Homestead Act makes it sound like, yeah, there was all this free, cheap land, free land out there in the West for people to come from Europe and other parts of the United States to settle. But the reality of this was, at one time, this was Dakota land, and some of it was Ojibwe land, and it was taken from them in pretty unfair treaties. The railroads were another source of cheap land for farmers. Uh, the government was very interested in seeing the railroads grow and be healthy companies, so they were given lots of land in the interior of the country. Now, what a railroad would do was it would sell this land, and selling the land gave it money, and then they could use this money to extend their rail lines. And so small towns popped up all along where the railroad was going. So the railroads were pretty important. Uh, another source of really cheap land was that the government also rewarded Civil War veterans, and they got free homesteads too. So free land, yeah. But All right, if you take a look... Uh, to my left, you see that picture there, and if you can think of a word that's going to go along with this picture, I would think that you're going to settle on the word greed. So there, are, we have them today, and we had them back then, and the word is speculators. So a speculator, some other words might be a flipper or a quick buck artist. It's anybody who gets involved in something where they want to make a fast profit. So they're getting in when the price is low, they hope to drive up that price and then sell it. Now, a speculator, sometimes they make big fortunes in doing that. Other times, uh, they guess wrong and they lose a lot of money. Uh, for the average person, a speculator is bad because it drives up prices. So sometimes we can think about speculators. Well, probably one good example are people that are getting into home flipping. So there's kind of a shortage of homes in the United States. So if you jump in and, and buy it, often you can take a home away from somebody who really needs it. You can do a little bit of fixing and turn around and sell it up, sell that home for a lot more money. Another example of probably a speculator is people who get involved in cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrencies are, are money, but it's not real money. You don't have a paper money. You don't have a coin. It's just held digitally. All right, so that's what I wanted to go over today with these slides. If you have any concerns or things that you didn't want, you know, hit the pause button, back up a little bit, and listen to me again. So thanks for being a good audience today. Mr. Burns, signing out.